Hi, I'm Shana, now in Mendenhall at the USGS, and I'm here to walk you through our recent paper, Aftershock Productivity of Intermediate Depth Earthquakes in Japan, co-written with my PhD advisor, Greg Barroza from Stanford. In this paper, we search for aftershock sequences of large intermediate depth earthquakes, which is a population of earthquakes thought to be aftershock deficient, and we examine factors controlling aftershock productivity within this group of earthquakes. So as we are familiar with as seismologists, aftershocks are often attributed to stress perturbations or the main shock. Aftershocks of earthquakes are commonly observed and tend to have universally observed patterns, such as Omori decay rate. On the other hand, aftershocks are usually not linked to intermediate depth earthquakes. These earthquakes are thought to occur at temperatures and pressures too high for normal brittle fracture mechanisms and need an extra mechanism to get them going. Prevailing theories include dehydration, brittlement, and thermal shear instabilities. In either case, another observation of intermediate depth earthquakes as a whole, they tend to be relatively deficient in aftershocks. However, intermediate depth earthquakes with aftershocks do exist. So our twofold motivation writing this paper was to examine if physical factors could be linked to the occurrence of intermediate depth aftershock sequences and to describe the behavior of these sequences. In our study, we divide Japan into several regions and study the behavior of intermediate depth aftershock sequences within each region. These regions span two different subducting plates, the older colder Pacific plate and the younger warmer Philippine sea plate. Furthermore, our selected regions display a long strike variations in physical properties. We counted aftershocks after large earthquakes within each region using a number of methods. Interestingly, we find that while most large earthquakes at intermediate depth had no discernible aftershock sequences as expected, the baseline productivity of whether or not a large earthquake would or would not be productive in aftershocks was most strongly correlated with a local compressional to shear wave velocity ratio, even when adjusted for factors such as depth or magnitude. Also, we found that when we looked at the spatial temporal duration of intermediate depth aftershock sequences, they were remarkably similar to empirical relations derived for shallow crustal earthquakes, such as the Gardner knockoff window. All of the productive sequences we found were in the Pacific plate and productive aftershock sequences occur where VPVS ratio is relatively higher along strike. This is commonly associated with the presence of water, which could indicate that a greater density of hydrated ancient faults have, which have subducted promotes aftershocks. The key takeaway here is that the presence of aftershocks seems to be related to the ability of the surroundings to propagate the aftershocks rather than the mechanism of the intermediate depth earthquakes themselves. As the behavior of the productive aftershock sequences closely resembles that of shallow aftershock sequences, we surmise that the environment may be relatively brittle, indirectly supporting a dehydration hypothesis for intermediate depth main shocks in the Pacific plate. On the other hand, the lack of aftershocks in the Philippine sea plate could be indicative of a more viscous regime. Now, I refer you all to read our full paper, which is available in Geophysical Journal International at the DOI listed on this slide. Thank you for your attention.